Good afternoon and welcome to our talk today. I am Carrie Cordova, an associate professor in the Department of American Studies and the associate director of the Center for Mexican American Studies, or as we know it, CMOS. Um, I'm also a co-chair of the search for a new director of CMOS with my colleague, Dr. Nestor Rodriguez, a professor in the Department of Sociology. This is a special moment for the center as it celebrates its 50th anniversary and also looks to the future. The next director will have a significant role in shaping Latino studies at the University of Texas at Austin. The duties of the director include, but are not limited to, planning and implementing original public programming, alumni relations, community outreach, and development efforts building community among faculty, staff, and students, and coordinating with senior university leadership and collaborating with other units on campus. The director will officially assume office on September 1st, 2021, and hold a four-year term. As co-chairs of the search, we are gathering public feedback and sharing this information with our Latino studies leadership and the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts. Everyone registered for this talk today will receive a request for feedback at the end of our talk. We invite you to attend this talk and to share with us your thoughts on the candidates and on the direction you would like to see for the Center for Mexican American Studies. Uh, we also plan to make the recordings of these talks available for those unable to attend, and those recordings will be accompanied with requests for further feedback. In presenting these candidates, I can offer that both of these candidates are outstanding faculty with enormous accomplishments. Uh, it is truly my pleasure to be uh, a part of this search. And I have the great pleasure of introducing Dr. Maggie Rivas Rodriguez this afternoon. Maggie Rivas Rodriguez is a professor in the School of Journalism and Media. She served as CMOS's Associate Director from 2004 to 2007, and has served on the CMOS Executive Committee. As the CMOS Associate Director, she created a brief oral history project dedicated to CMOS's 35th anniversary and led a university-wide celebration, College by College. Dr. Rivas Rodriguez is the Founder and Director of the Voces Oral History Center formerly the U.S. Latino and Latina World War II Oral History Project. Voces has recorded interviews with over 1,400 men and women throughout the country. Its mission is to create a greater awareness of the Latino, Latina experience in the U.S. Currently, Voces is spearheading the Voces of a Pandemic Oral History Project, a partnership of 13 institutions documenting the Latino, Latina experience during COVID-19. Voces of a Pandemic's interviews may be viewed on the Voces Center's YouTube channel. She also has authored or edited six books. Her most recent was Texas Mexican Americans and Post-War Civil Rights. She is also the founder and editor of the US Latina and Latino Oral History Journal, an annual peer-reviewed publication. Before earning her PhD in communications from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Dr. Rivas Rodriguez worked as a journalist in major newsrooms, the Boston Globe, WFAA TV in Dallas, and the Dallas Morning News. Her last job was as the Dallas Morning News' US-Mexico border bureau chief based in El Paso. And some of us here in Austin may have benefited from hearing her on our local NPR station as well. Maggie has been active since her college years to bring greater diversity and inclusion to the news media. She was on the committee that organized and founded the National Association of Hispanic Journalists in 1982. She began the NAHJ's most successful student training project, a convention newspaper produced by college students and professionals. The convention newspaper became the model for other industry organizations as an effective way to develop mentoring relationships and to train students. She holds a master's degree from Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism, and her Bachelor of Journalism degree is from UT Austin. <laughs> so <laughs> it is my great pleasure 
to uh, turn this presentation over to Dr. Maggie Rivas Rodriguez. Um, after she completes her presentation, we will be um, welcoming uh, Q&A and questions in the chat. And I will be uh, serving as a moderator for those questions. We invite you to ask your questions whenever you feel like it, and then we will be opening up the floor after her presentation. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Rivas Rodriguez. Thanks, Maggie. Thank you, Carrie. And thank you to you and to Nestor for serving as the search committee chairs. And thank you to the CIMA staff who have added the, these talks to your list of, I know a lot of duties that you're, you're doing this spring. And I think the people out there who are listening to this and who care enough about CMAS that are, uh, that they want to, they want to see what's going on and they want to have their, their voices heard as well. Um, I had a, I have a, a little uh, presentation that I'd like to show with, show you. And it is, um, it features a lot of photographs. One of the things that I, that I do is I do take pictures, but I also like to work with photographers. And so you're going to see a lot of the photographs that we've prepared for uh, different events that we've done at UT Austin uh, through the Voices Project and, and elsewhere. So here we go. Here we go. Hang on one second, I see. Okay, so I, in telling you about my goals and my vision for CMUS, I think it's important to, to uh, share with you where I come from and the factors that have made me who I am today and who have helped me understand what I think uh, I would like to see out of CMUS. So I grew up in a small town south of San Antonio called Divine. I am a product of Catholic schools until they closed it down and then I went to public schools. Uh, in this picture, it's me and four of my sisters. Um, and there's another older sister and an older brother. So we were seven kids all together. Uh, I'm the, the, the tall, lanky one on the right-hand side. Um, in Divine, Texas, and in a lot of places in Texas and throughout the Southwest, not a lot was ex expected of people like me. So for one of us to graduate from high school, it was a major achievement. And so when my sister Eva graduated from high school, uh, we had relatives coming in from all over San Antonio and the other South Texas towns who wanted to celebrate this milestone for our families. Um, I'm the, the one who's holding uh, on the right hand with the holding the hands of the little boy. But it really is, it's important to say this because it, the, the obstacles for people like me to get an education were pretty formidable. And in fact, when I was graduating from, when I was a freshman in Divine High School, half of my, my, um, my classmates were Mexican American and the other half were Anglo. By the time I graduated, we had a class of 72 people, only 16 of us were Mexican Americans. So I think that gives you an idea of how hard it was. Uh, we did an oral history with Nestor Rodriguez, in fact, a few years ago, and he succeeded in Corpus Christi, despite a lot of obstacles in, in the way of Mexican American students. And he talked about how some of his relatives weren't able to succeed as he had. And he kept on saying, you know, I really thought that if you worked hard enough and you, you did enough, that you should be able to su succeed just like me. And I think that he came to the conclusion, as I have too, opportunities should be available to all students, regardless of how motivated they are. And we have to see what's inside of them and bring that out so that they too can succeed. I came here to UT Austin. At the time it was known as the hippie school. And uh, these are my parents. Uh, my father only went as far as the fourth grade. My mom went to the eighth grade, but later on she got a GED. They couldn't have be, been more proud of me and more supportive of me over the years. And uh, I think that this is true for a lot of the, the, the Hispanic students that we have today. And I'm gonna get to that in a minute. UT was really important to me and, and I love UT. It expanded my horizons in measurably in so many different directions. Um, some of the questions that I had when I was growing up in Divine Texas about why is it that Mexican Americans in our city don't have the same opportunities and don't have leadership positions. When I got to college, I started even asking more questions and deeper questions. I became a journalism major. And in that, 
in that major, I started to look at why do we not see more stories about people like us in the news? And why is it that whenever we do see those stories, they're often stereotypical stories? So I was part of a small group called uh, Chicanos Interesados en Comunicaciones. We organized uh, a small group and we put together a two-day conference at the Catholic Student Center. And incidentally, CMAS was one of our big sponsors, as was the College of Communication. That's me with Ronnie Zamora from, from Brownsville, Texas, who remains a good friend to this day. I also got a chance to skydive at UT Austin. Um, I broke my nose during the practice right before that, but that's another story for another day. One thing that I learned and I took very much to heart at UT was to create opportunities if there were none there. So I wanted to have a, an internship in Mexico. And so I went to Monterrey, Mexico, where we have my mom's family. And I was able to get an internship at El Norte, which is a really uh, prestigious newspaper. Uh, I improved my Spanish tenfold and it remains one of the most important events of my life and very transformative. After I got graduated from Columbia, I, I did, as Carrie noted, I became a journalist. But some of those same questions about why do we not have more people like me in newsrooms? And why is it that when we do, very few of us are elevated to positions of gatekeeper? So I became very active in, the, in what is now the NHJ. And, and yes, our, our student newspaper, we called it the Latino Reporter. We founded it, I, I worked on it, I founded it in 1988. Um, it continues to this day and it became institutionalized. And I think that's an important thing for all of us to remember is the changes that we, that we bring can't just be something that we put together ourselves, but it has to be institutionalized in a way that it's going to be continued even after we're gone. When I got to UT Austin in 1988, um, after, after graduate school at North Carolina, uh, I started the, the US Latino Latina World War II Oral History Project. And I learned and have learned and continue learning so much just in the organization of, of doing this and putting it together and finding out ways of, um, of accomplishing what we wanna accomplish on, on pretty, a pretty uh, string, uh, uh, shoestring budget. But one thing that it has taught me is I have an amazing network of contacts in the news media and elsewhere. I have built up strong organizational administrative skills and I have learned to be incredibly resourceful and creative as many of us are in learning how to raise funds, how to leverage the kind of in-kind support that we're able to get. So you can know that whatever I do learn uh, and have learned along the way, I'm going to apply to whatever I end up doing next. One thing that I did learn was creating publications from oral history interviews. It's a wonderful way to share your findings. So this is a picture of the CMAS 35th anniversary, but through, through the, the World War II project, we did produce eight tabloid sized newspapers. And, uh, and when I studied abroad in Spain, um, I, I, it was an oral history class and we put together a, a compilation of the three years of work and it was about the Spanish Civil War and the Franco dictatorship. And, and I do see oral history as an, a really important uh, part of telling the US Latino story or the, the, the story of Latinos and Latinas in the US. And I, I do think that it's something that, that we can continue to mine. One of the things that I've learned that I still consider crucial is sharing our findings with the community. One of the first things I did was organize a conference in 2000 with David Montajano, uh, who was then the CMAS director. We called it the US Latinos and Latinas in World War II conference. And people came from all over the country. It took us a year to organize it and plan it out, but we had an amazing um, level of interest. And I have to take that back. I think, I think that actually Jose Limon was the, was the director at the time. So I'm sorry about that. Um, but one thing that I found, and I think this is important for, for us as we're doing community work, is when we do share our findings and we share it with the people that, we've, that, we are, that we're researching about, sometimes they will challenge our conclusions. And I think that's a healthy thing for them, for us, because too often we in academia do our research all alone 
or sometimes in, uh, in small groups, and we publish them in journals or, or academic books. And the people that we're writing about aren't really able to read them. They're, it's not accessible in the language that is, that's everyday language. So for our conference, it was really wonderful to see our, our, uh, our conclusions challenged sometimes. And I think it's, it's a really exciting thing and I hope to continue that. In 2015, we I organized another conference, Latinos, the Voting Rights Act and Political and Civic Engagement. And it's really to look at the 1975 Voting Rights Act, which expanded voting rights to Latinos and other language minorities. It was hugely successful. Uh, I was able to raise a lot of money from across campus and off campus. And there was a great interest in getting us to uh, continue to, to have it in second year and have it at an annual conference. Um, I thought it would be better if college campuses uh, moved it around, but there, was, there were no takers on that. The other way that I believe in sharing our wealth is in 2017, we did something called short courses, the Voices Short Courses. We were able to bring people from um, from around the country, really, uh, to to take the courses. It was pretty inexpensive. But the other thing was, we brought in people um, from Houston and from throughout ca campus, from University of Houston, to talk about uh, topics like how to write a children's book, how to write a memoir, um, how to preserve your your family heirlooms, photographs, letters, things like that. And it was really a euphoric. Uh, experience for me and it was it had a lot of buy-in from people out in the public something that I, I would love to see CMUS continue because CMUS has more bandwidth than 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 just Maggie I know that one of the the major issues confronting uh, CMUS and UT Austin right now is the HSI status and one part of that one one goal before we're able to, to really embrace it is to create a, a welcoming environment for our students and for their families. And there's lots of different ways we might be able to do that. One way is to showcase Latino studies, faculty, students, and staff with the world. People may not know that somebody like me grew up in a place like Divine, Texas, where the expectations were very, were pretty low. So if they have a chance to see that someone like them it has been able to succeed and has been able to uh, navigate the system, maybe that'll give some hope to people. The other thing is, is to promote one another. And I have to say this, um, I know that Laura Gutierrez is the other candidate for this position. And I have to say, I have the utmost admiration, respect for her. I know that she's a great scholar and I know from personal experience with my younger son that she's a wonderful teacher. She took uh, my son, Agustin, on a study abroad to Mexico City, and it was a wonderful transformative experience. So my entire family is, is a huge Lara Gutierrez fan. And whatever happens with this CMS directorship, I will always be a Laura fan, and I hope that uh, she feels the same way about me. But it brings up kind of a larger issue is, I do think that we need to promote each other, we Latino faculty and staff. I think we need to, put the best look forward to the world. We need to let people know how great Richard Flores is and Deborah Parra Medina and Karma Chavez and Carrie Cordova. We need to say that, we need to respect one another because if we expect central administration and our colleges and our departments to respect us, we have to demonstrate that respect and we have to show each other that we have one another's back. Um, I do think another thing that we can do to uh, bolster our HSI status chances is to develop partnerships across the state and across the country. CMUS is not just for UT Austin. Our graduates have gone on throughout the country and I'd like to link to them in different ways so that we can show that we may stay in Texas, but the, the CMUS reach really extends far beyond the state. For faculty, these are some of the, the, the goals that I would like to see. I served as the co-chair of the Council on Racial and Ethnic Equity and Diversity, which is called CREED usually. And I conducted several focus groups with Latino faculty and uh, across campus. Um, one, there were three things that, that came up over and over again. One was they felt a great pressure to serve. 
over and over again and over and above what was being required of, of a lot of other people. Um, and they felt that they, they had a loyalty to UT and they had a loyalty to living in the state of Texas. And this is largely because their families had roots here and they didn't want to, to try to get a, a, a raise by applying for a job in Wisconsin. So then their department would have to do a counter offer. They, they didn't want to play that game. And so they felt that they were being penalized by their loyalty to UT. Uh, and the other theme that came across was they felt that there was a lack of support at their departmental and their college level. So there's some things that we can do quantitatively to improve that. Uh, one is to increase our numbers overall. Uh, we know that our, our percentage of the faculty is abysmal, um, but we're, we can do better at, at making sure that those that the few that we do have on campus are brought into the CMOS tent a little bit better. So right now, on the according to UT, we have 332 Hispanic faculty across campus. We only have 46 CMOS affiliates. I think we can do something about that. And I think that'll really help us in so many different ways. We can build on those strengths and we can ask each other for help and, uh, and build our network even just on campus. But the other thing is qualitatively, we have to not just say that we value our faculty, we actually have to value our faculty and show them that we value our faculty. There are current problems. Um, one of them is this, this, uh, this, this feeling by, by faculty that they're underappreciated. I believe that the affinity to our families should be not seen as a liability, but rather as one of the great strengths that we have as faculty to, this, to the UT Austin. And I do think it's something that our students, in fact, their families have to know that we value family. One solution uh, might be as far as them feeling overstretched because they're pulled in so many different directions is something that I've become pretty good at. And that's finding a way to link research with teaching and service. I've been teaching oral history for many, many years now. And I've most of my books are actually all of my books that I've published since I got to UT Austin have all been centered on oral history methodology and oral history methodology because oftentimes we don't have uh, archives that we can look at so that we can tell the Latino story, but an oral history interview is something that we can certainly mine and we have been mining them for many years now. There is kind of an easy kind of break off that we can do. And we've been doing it uh, at Voices for a few years now. It's been very successful. We can do mini research projects. We call them Voices of, and then we say Voices of, we did Voices of Documentary Film in 2018. And then we did Voices of, of Mariachi in San Antonio, teaming up with the Mexico Center at UTSA and with Texas A&M University at San Antonio. Um, we teamed up with them. We interviewed 14 mariachis over a weekend, March 8th of last year. And then we produced this wonderful uh, manuscript for the Latino Latina World, uh, Oral History Journal. And we can do it around other topics. It's really, that, that model is really easy to, to adapt to other topics. One thing I'd like for, for us to do as kind of a way to get faculty research, but also to see, uh, community involvement and student involvement is look at specific topics like here in Austin, we can look at the economy furniture strike, which has been under researched. We can also look at the South Texas border initiative of the, of the 1980s. It was a legislative bill that was passed by, uh, by, by our legislature. And because of that, we do have a um, Texas A&M Kingsville and a Texas A&M Corpus Christi and Texas A&M Laredo. It has been under researched and we, we, I had worked with Victor Sines a couple of years ago and Jaime Chayin and, uh, and a small group of people to put together a conference to look at this. And uh, we, we kind of got derailed a little bit, but I do think it has legs and I think it's something that we should definitely pursue in the near future. For undergraduates, what I'd like to see is I'd like to uh, expand our wonderful Latino studies internship programs. I think it's doing a great job and I know that one thing that's holding us back a little bit is we don't have the funding for it. But I do think that funding is there if we just look for it. 
one way that I'd like to do is to work with the Hispanic Alumni Network and perhaps industry groups to help us raise funds for these interns. I'd like to cast a wider net for our students who are CMUS affiliates, who, who come to CMUS events, who take our classes and make them more aware of what Latino studies has to offer. And I, I think we could do that by working across campus with different uh, people in admissions and, and other places. For graduate students, things that I'd like to see. I would like to see us work with the other Latino studies units to develop workshops on things you'll need to know as an academic, but we're afraid to ask, or th things you would like to know as an academic, but didn't even know that you needed to know until you got there. And all of a sudden you're, you're swimming and you're trying to figure it out. One thing that I think has been really helpful for me is that I know how to do things like programming. Um, and it's, it's enabled me to have a reach far beyond my own department and my own college. And I think it's important for our students to be thinking in terms of how they can maximize what little time they have by programming. I'd also like to work with them to, to learn a little bit more about publishing tips, things that they can use so that they can get published uh, even as graduate students or beyond in their first jobs. And the other thing I'd like to work with them is uh, using social media to promote their work. It's, it's kind of something you do have to promote yourself. For the community, uh, two things that I'd like to see is uh, us adopting the short courses workshop framework. It, it, it worked beautifully for bosses. And I think that there are people out there, I know it because I get these emails from people now and again, folks asking for uh, help on, I want to write a book, I want to learn how to do this. And they're asking me, and it's really not within my, my uh, framework or what my responsibilities as a journalist professor or even as the director of, of the Voices Oral History Center. But I do think it's something that would make sense for a CMUS to take on. Uh, so I'd like to see that. And I'd like to see us uh, get community involvement in the Voices of. When we do Voices of, we use, we use interviewers, we, we use uh, interviewers, we use, and we, of course, interviewees, but make them a part of it, make them realize that, that we, we need them, we need our community so that we can tell our stories. So I know that the other major CMAS priority right now is Cincuenta Mas Uno, or the Movidas Conference. Um, I would love to see it as a reunion of former, current CMUS directors, associate directors, affiliates, students, community supporters. This is such a great milestone for CMUS. And, and I know that we were already celebrating over the summer. I've watched some of the, the work that, that uh, y'all have done at, uh, at the MAC. Um, I think it, it's, it's something that we should be doing reunions and we should be looking at how we can reflect on how far we've come and how far CMOS has evolved and then look ahead and see where we wanted to go. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maggie. That was a rich presentation and you've already sparked some questions. So there's, um, we'll start with the chat and you seem to have sparked a question from a former CMOS director. Gil Cardenas has asked, your leadership has enabled Voces to gain national recognition. What role do you see yourself playing in advancing the impact that CMOS and Latino studies can have nationally? Hey Gil, thank you for the question. Um, I was just saying to, to Carrie and, uh, and Katie Buchanan before this thing that I worked as a TV reporter and uh, for a couple of years. And one thing that you did during live shots was hope the anchors didn't ask you a question that you didn't know the answer to. Um, so I'm gonna do my best with this, with this question. I think we already at CMUS have a network that we can count on. I don't, and I don't, I don't pretend to know this because I have not been involved in, in the day-to-day. -day. I don't know to what extent we've already started to cultivate those resources and cultivate our network, but I do think that it's, it's a wonderful way for us to extend our reach beyond that, beyond our, our own network. I would love to see us be uh, part of when, when, when UT is, is, recruiting students from throughout the state, I'd love for us to be, to have a seat at that table and to be there as, as uh, exemplars of 
this is this is what's possible that we're here. Um, perhaps one thing that we can do, it's an easy thing, is when we have conferences, I don't know that CMUS doesn't already do this, so I apologize for that. But if there are conferences when CMUS can have a table and have an informational table and and provide information about what we're doing, and as well as looking at uh, looking at what is going on with with what other uh, Latino studies departments are doing around the country, departments and centers are doing, I think that we can be a really enriching uh, experience. But I do think that one small thing that we can do is we can ask for our alumni throughout the country for help. Voces has been doing this uh, crowd sort crowd uh, funding um, thing for a while now. And we've raised, one time we raised 22,000, then we raised 7,000, so you can raise 5,000. But just that thing, it, it's, it's the money is important, the money is not a small thing. But the more important thing is that your community, whatever you consider that community, becomes aware of what you're doing and you ask them for help. So I think that one thing I'd love to see is us is, is cultivate those resources beyond our, our, our campus and look for ways that we can rely on them for some help. All right, and we're going to keep moving, Maggie, because you're getting a lot of questions. So uh -huh. I'm going to turn to a Q&A question, which is, you have wonderful ideas about what the Latinx community can do for the university, but the university also needs to act on our behalf. As the director, what specific actions would you take to address Latinx equity issues on campus, including the lack of a Latinx central office administrator at the level of vice president or above, and to resolve the longstanding issues identified in the Hispanic faculty equity report? That's a great question. I think it's an important question. Um, specifically, what I would like to do is, I would like to, to spend some time to study the Hispanic Equity Report more fully. Um, it's, been, it's been, what, 18 months since it came out. I'd like to study it more fully, and I would like to work with the group, the, the liberal arts uh, professors who put that report together, and look for ways that we can find benchmarks. I do think it's an important thing, and I think it's a good leverage for us to use. Uh, the, the, the authors of that report, especially Alberto Martinez, spent a lot of time and crunched a lot of numbers to arrive at those, at those uh, uh, findings. So I think that we need to, do, to look at the report, develop some benchmarks, and then meet with central administration. I do think that we have room to make some, some requests from central administration. And I would like for us to do it as a unified front because I think we can speak more loudly and we can have uh, much more power if we're, if we're together. Great, and now I'm gonna ask you from the chat from Jorge Haynes, does CMOS UT look beyond Austin as part of the larger Latino community in Dallas, Houston, the border, et cetera? Thank you, Jorge. Uh, glad you're on. Um, I do think that CMUS has, has links far beyond our campus. Uh, I, I, I've mentioned that a couple of minutes ago. Our graduates are all over the place. Our former students are all over the place and they're in, they remain loyal to CMUS. And so, uh, so I do see that we are, we're, for us to really to really reach our potential as a center, I would like to see us go beyond the the, the Austin area and 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 even make uh, make sure that we have a national presence. Uh, we should be able to place our faculty on different boards and make sure that we have a voice in different um, on different issues. Uh, myself, I'm on the. Voices is part of the the, muse, the Friends of the Amer Museum of the American Latino, and I think things like that are really important for us to have a presence there and to make sure because those national issues really do end up having a local effect. So one thing that I would like to to see as the I would like for us to get involved in some of those efforts to make sure that we have an, a Museum of the American Latino in Washington D.C. And let's see what other issues we can we can use as a group. 
All right, Maggie. So we're um, we're going to keep moving ahead. And uh, a question from our colleague Maria Cotera is asking, well, pointing out, thank you for a wonderful presentation. The University of Texas is home to a number of public history and digital history scholars and projects. How would you bring these projects together to highlight this hidden strength of our scholarly community? Thank you, Maria, and uh, and so glad you're on. Um, that's a great question and you are absolutely right. Uh, you coming and I know we had uh, our hiring in RTF, um, Aldama, I know that those, those are two serious, serious uh, practitioners of digital humanities. I'd like for us to see what we can do together. I'd like for us to see how we can really showcase that and see where there is synergy between CIMAS and what Maria Cotera is doing and what uh, Professor Aldame is doing and see what all other things are going on on campus so that we can bring this to the fore. One of the things that I know, I, I did listen, Maria, I listened to your to the interview that you did with the, the folks from the University of Houston, uh, the recovery project. And I love their approach to community and making sure that more community members are, are getting trained and being able to take some of these on for themselves. I would love to see some of those ideas replicated here in Austin. All right, Maggie, thank you for um, these wonderful uh, answers. We're gonna switch to the chat and Yolanda Estrada Munoz has asked, one of the problems I see is that there is a misunderstanding about what Latino, Latina studies teaches. I get so much pushback when I try to promote the studies, the books we read, and what we learn in general that I would love to see something put out there, maybe on social media, about what it is that we studied, are studying. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, you know what? I know. I know that is an issue. And I, I know that there have been... Um, so many criticisms that are unfounded because people don't know what Latino studies is and they don't know what ethnic studies is. I do think that we need to do something at the, the K through 12 level. And perhaps part of that is developing curriculum guides, teacher guides. Uh, Voices did this many years ago for Latinos and Latinas in World War II. And it just became, uh, it was, a, it was a, a pretty thick teacher guide with exercises. And we, it's being used today. It's being used by people today. I think it, part of it is just the, it's so mystified to a lot of people, it, it seems it's a, it's a mystery of what it is. And they think that it's very radical. And you've seen that over and over again, that Latino studies, Chicano studies, Mexican American studies are seen as being really radical. And so if, if we're able to, to demonstrate and, and really introduce some of our teacher guides and our curriculum um, guides to, to teachers earlier and, and make sure that we have a seat at, the, at that table. Uh, Voices has, it's one of the things that I've always wanted us to do. We just don't, I, I don't have the bandwidth to do it. But I know in order to get some of these things passed, you know, if you're working through the Texas Education Agency, that's one thing. But the other way to do it is just to attend the social studies conferences at the state level, at the national level, and have a table there where you're explaining this is what you're doing. It's going to, there's going to be some people that will, whose minds will remain closed to it no matter what. But I do think that there's enough people that, uh, that we need to reach, and we really do need to reach our young people. I get requests from teachers who are in Kentucky who are saying, all of a sudden I looked, I looked across the room and half of my students are Latino and I have nothing to, to, to teach them with. I have no curriculum for them. So I do think there's a, an interest in that. And I do think that we have to be strong even in the face of criticism. We have to maintain that what we're doing is important and we're not gonna let it stop us. So uh, I would love to see us do that. I also would love to see us do some um, teacher education workshops. Voices has a, a, one of these teacher education numbers that whenever we hold an event, a teacher can attend and they can count that toward their continuing edu professional education for that year. So I would like to see CMAS uh, incorporate that into everything that we do so the teachers are able to be exposed to some of the great research that our scholars are doing. 
Thank you, Maggie. I see you getting a lot of uh, good responses in the chat there. Um, Casilda Clarich has asked, what types of engagement do you foresee with the Hispanic Alumni Network to further gain your mission and goals? Um, well, thank you, Cassie. Thank you for being on. And uh, I would love to work with the Hispanic um, Alumni Network. It, as far as I know, there are something like 8,000 uh, UT alums who are Hispanic in the Austin area. I have no idea how many there are statewide, but that is that is uh, something that we should tap into. I would, and I know, I know because I've gone to the the fiesta that that the Hispanic uh, Alumni Network has. I, there's this great energy and this this urge that people have to do something for UT Austin. It's a very natural relationship to partner up with CMAS and to see how we can, and, and they're willing to help raise money. I know that, that, uh, that actually they've helped us raise a little bit of money for, for bosses, but I think CMAS has more, is more attractive because it's broader, its mission is broader than what bosses is. So I think there's a really natural alliance there and I'd love to explore how we can we can help. And particularly, really and truly, uh, I would love to see the Hispanic and Alumni Network help to fund some of these internships so that we can train our students. A lot of times our students can't take internships in their field because they have to pay the rent. And so right now, Voices has five interns and some of them would be doing things like uh, working in retail had it not been that I, I was able to, you know, scrape up enough money so that they can do something that's related to their to their their journalism degree. So I would love to see us do something like that. Let's start off and, and figure out how we can plan small and then work towards something and see where, where it goes. So Maggie, I'm gonna ask uh, uh, Charles Ruckel, um, our uh, colleague uh, has asked, what is the biggest challenge faced by the CMOS director at UT Austin? I think you've illuminated several, but would you like to pick out the biggest? <laughs> um, yeah, and thank you, Charles. Um, I think that right now, I think there's a little bit of a divide on our faculty. I, I read the, the story that came out on uh, NBC Latino yesterday about how serious the UT Austin is about HSI status. I know that there's a lot of skepticism there. And, and I know that uh, I, I, was listen, I was reading some of the emails that were going back and forth between some of the uh, older Chicano scholars about this. I, I think that that's one of the biggest challenges we have. I think that we do need to, we need to talk, we need to see where there's common ground and we need to, as, as, as a group, we need to find solutions and ways that we can, can move all of us forward. You know, the Hispanic Equity Report was really instrumental in opening a lot of doors and providing a lot of funding. So, so it, the, the folks that worked on that are to be applauded and I would love to really work with them very closely so that we can, we can work together. Um, and there's gonna be some things that we're never gonna agree on. There's gonna be skepticism no matter what the administration does and other people are gonna be on the other side that feel like you know, uh, President Hartzell is very, very sincere about uh, what, what he's attempting. Uh, but I do think that that's one of the biggest, the, the biggest challenges is bringing us together, finding that common ground and respecting one another so that we can we can then affect changes for all of the Latino faculty um, community. So Maggie, um, Lupe Morin has asked a question that um, in both in the chat and the Q and A that are a good follow up to that. So. Um, First remarking, amazing presentation. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez would be an asset to the CMOS program. How do you plan to enlighten or ensure the UT president and his VPs are totally informed, engaged in CMOS programs, support from the top administration? That's a really great um, question, Lupe. And, and it's kind of something that I've been struggling with since I got here to UT Austin, uh, I've seen how, you know, looking at my own experience with VOSIS, 
trying to become a priority in this giant ocean of other priorities. And I've been lucky enough to sit on a, uh, I was on the University Budget Council, President Powers appointed me, I was there for three years. And so I had a bird's eye view of what it looks like to see deans and vice presidents and provosts and vice provosts come in and even the head of uh, athletics come in to, to plead their case. And to every one of them, their own issues were the most important issues that there were. And so that's, that's one of, the, one of the, the, the problems or the challenges that we face. How do we communicate that our issues are a priority? I think we have great leverage right now. I think as we're attempting to achieve HSI status and as the demographics of our state are increasingly Latino, that's leverage that we can use. So I'm not sure a specific answer on that, but I do know that it's something that we do need to work on. And I would love to, to hear from people who have a lot more experience on getting their cases known, but I do know this. I do know that when we can speak with a unified voice, we have a lot more power than when we're speaking in, in fractured voices. So I do know that that's important. And, uh, and then I'd like for us to put our heads together and figure out how we do become a priority for the university. So Maggie, thank you so much. Um, th this question nicely follows up in the chat um, a little bit about HSI status. How, um, from Nora Comst uh, Comstock, how, how would you help to recruit more Latino students to UT? And with an additional sort of question of how can we bring more Latinos into STEM and how to bring in these faculty and students into these areas. Wow, thank you, Nora. Um, um, and I've got to say, you know, a lot of the people who are asking questions are, are true um, pioneers in their own rights. And Nora is one of those great pioneers. So I'm, I'm really delighted to have her uh, in the audience today. Getting Latino students to come on board I'm not sure that that is such a big challenge. I think that as particularly if we're able to look at and count on our network of, of Latino uh, graduates, if we are able to, to get them to be our ambassadors for lack of a better word and go out in the communities in, in wherever they are, if they're in Lubbock or in their Wichita Falls, wherever they are, and, and let students know about the, the opportunities there are here for, for, for Latino students. I think that that would, that would go a long way, but we do need to link. We need to cultivate those, those networks and we need to work those networks. And, and I've got to tell you, I've been doing it for a long time. It's a lot of work, but it's really fun work. It's, it's really the cultivation of, our, of a network is really fun. And, and, I do, and there's such loyalty to the Hispanic, um, to UT Austin, it's it's really amazing. I think that we can we can really leverage our uh, what I hope will be a relationship would be a relationship with the Hispanic um, alumni network. I'd love to see that happen, um, but I think we can do some simple, easy to do things as well, just by putting up on our website on the CMAS website some of the pictures of the amazing CMAS graduation. Uh, every year, if you haven't gone to a CMOS graduation, you owe it to yourself. It's so much fun. It's like it's the, the room is just filled with joy. Families come from all over the state. They bring the abuelitos and the crying babies. And then there's a, you know, they do a little reading of, from the student. I think that if we had, if we had put together a little video about what that's like, and then have some photographs from that event on our website, as students are going through, I think that they'll get a better sense of what that is. But the other part is, I do think that teacher workshops can actually work to help out this way. If we're able to start getting teachers from throughout the state to come to UT Austin, to learn a little bit about us, I think that our reputation will continue to grow. I mean, CMAS already has a stellar reputation. I mean, there's no question. People know what CMAS is, and of course they know UT Austin. We just need to build on that and expand it and make it a little bit more solid maybe. All right, so I'm gonna just note for our audience that we are getting close, we have 10 minutes left. 
and we have like six questions. So I'm not sure, but we're going to try. We'll see where I'll, we I'll get ask, to. I'll talk real fast. Okay. So our colleague Antonio Vasquez is asking, thank you, Maggie, for your presentation and for your gifts to our community. Can you shed more light on how you envision balancing the continued growth of the Voces Oral History Center and CMOS? Both projects are multifaceted and deserving of complete attention logistically. So what's your bandwidth, Maggie? <laughs> yeah, that is a, that's a great question. And thank you for asking it, Antonio. Um, here is the, the thing. It, I, could, I could serve as CMOS director uh, if, I were, if I were to be able to bring together, bring in a, a really talented and, and credentialed staff director for Voices. Voices is at a point where I'm not saying it's a well-oiled machine because my staff would laugh at me if I said that, but it really is, it's in such, it's, it's mature now. It was my baby for many years. It's mature and it's ready to, it's ready for an, the next phase. And frankly, I think it's time for me to, to step back a little bit and let some new blood come in and, um, and, and add what they would like to do. So it, it, it would be very doable to have, to have a staff director do this. We still will need a faculty director and I would still be that faculty director, but it would, it would not be the intense, um, the intense relationship that I have with WASIS right now. Okay, and so to keep us moving, our uh, colleague Roxanne Trudarse has asked, while some progress in community connections has been made, CMOS is still seen as part of the ivory tower. What community connections do you have or would you nurture to help to break down this perception and reality? Yeah, um, I do think that the, 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 two, the two programs that I'm suggesting, one would be Voces of, looking at Voces of the Economy Furniture Strike. We, we do the interviews, we do the research, and then we do a public finding off campus. You know, I think it's important to, to sometimes, I love doing things at the, at the MAC. I think that's a wonderful location, but there might be some other locations where we can go to the community. Uh, so I do think that, and I think the short courses, those are really important ways for us to share the resources that we have on our campus with, with the community. And I, you know, those, those are important. I, I know, I understand what you're saying, Roxanne, and I do think that it's, it's, it's often because people look at us and they think that what we are now is, they don't realize that there's a background to that, that there, there, that there was that, that kid growing up in Divine, Texas um, and, and other places. So I do think that if, if we're able to make that connection with the community and let them know that we value, we value what they bring to the table and, uh, and get them involved in, the, in some of these uh, small research projects. And I'd also like to, you know, I don't, I think it's important to, to, to listen to what, what we're, what they're telling us. So I would love to hear from the community what they would like to see more of, of CMAS. I do know that one thing that I have heard is they would like to see CMAS represented in more events. And I think that we could do part of that, but I, but I also think that it's important to let people know what are, what are realistic expectations that, you know, there are, there's a, a full-time job and there's, there's family and there's other things. Um, but I do think that we can, uh, we, can, we can find out what is it that you would like to see from CMAS. You're moving along, Maggie. <laughs> so uh, we have a question from Martha Cotera, or it's a sort of twofold question. So one is, please detail your plans for improving UT Latino community relations. And <laughs> how do we achieve accountability in recruitment and retention of students once we become an HSI? Uh, avoid being used as usual for additional funding and sorry about my household <laughs> interruption there being avoid being used as what being used as usual for additional oh. funding so to being turned into a, a tap for funding I believe would be sort of a yeah well I do think you know uh, I think Martha's uh, question is based on uh, a lot of life experience that she has seen so so what is the first part of the question Carrie um, sure. It's a, please detail your plans for improving UT Latino community relations. Oh, okay. So I think I just, I did, uh, I did just say, well, UT Latino, um, 
from from the standpoint of CMOS, I've I've kind of outlined what I think we can do as the as the as CMOS. Um, as far as what we can expect from the university, uh, I would I would love to know what kinds of ideas there might be for that. Um, I do think that under when when Greg Vincent was the head of DDCE, we had wonderful wonderful events once a year, and I think that. Uh, you know, it, it's something that maybe they, UT might might want to look at. I, I don't know that I, I don't know that I can speak to what the university can do. Um, I would like to hear some ideas of what some of those might look like. As far as not CMS not just being used as a tool, um, that is a really really good question, and I think that we we can leverage our position to have some pretty frank discussions with our administration. Uh, I, I think this comes along the same way as becoming a priority. Looking at what the, we're, I don't know if we're in the middle of it or just in the quiet phase, but we're in the middle, we're, we're doing, UT is doing some big campaign to, to raise more endowment. I would like for us to, to talk about where does, where does CMA, so where does Latino studies fall within the, the plans for the endowment? How can we have access to some of those donors and go to meetings with them? And I do think that, you know, I, I know that the, um, in our college, we have a great relationship with our development people and, and, and they've been very helpful. So I wanna learn from them, what can we do to be more of a priority? And one thing that I've heard over the years is one way to become a priority is to bring in a lot of money, but it's kind of, you know, the chicken or the egg, how can you bring a lot of money if you don't have the contact with those folks? But I do think that we can, we can have those, those frank discussions with people and, uh, and find out how we can, we can leverage our position, which I think we're in, a, we're in a good position right now to be able to, to make some requests and try, and try to understand what it is that we can do so that we can, we can, uh, we can become more of a priority. Okay, Maggie, I'm going to try to enfold a couple of questions into one last question for you. And so I, I'm, I'm going to just point out some things. So uh, Dr. Jose Limon has actually pointed out that we, of course, have um, a number of CMOS doctoral uh, students and portfolio students that are now our alumni and is interested in how you might tap that group. Right. Um, Cynthia Perez is asking about financial aid and um, support for our students and the ways in which some students are choosing to go elsewhere because they're not necessarily getting the financial aid they need from UT. So if you have some thoughts on that. Um, and then I think uh, if you want to consider answering a K through 12 curriculum in ethnic studies question and the role that CMOS can play in supporting that, that would be our third sort of big question. Um, and I am going to then suggest if you would like, you can end with the, why do you want to be the CMOS director, right? So I think we have a question about the portfolio students, about um, financial aid, and about ethnic studies in K through 12, and then the why. Okay, okay. Uh, so uh, tapping our graduates up. I think it would, we do have a lot of grad, uh, you know, people that went through and had a portfolio in Mexican American studies. I'm, I'm expecting that we have those, those names and contacts in different ways. I would love to see them be part of, of kind of our network and, and make sure that we use them so that we can consider them for things like bring them back to give uh, the, uh, the Americo Paredes talk, which is one of the, the highlights of the year for us. Uh, we can consider bringing them in to, to perhaps guest lecture for classes, at least keep them part of the CMAS family so that we can count on them and, they, and we can make sure that, that we, can, we can rely on them. Also to help us recruit other graduate students. And maybe finally, we need to work on, on, on perhaps uh, building an endowment for future graduate students and, and help and get them to help us. And maybe that part of the endowment can be 
to, to provide some of the financial aid for our PhD students and our, our, uh, our master's students who had portfolios. I think that's that if you ask people to do something, give them something to do, they're much more likely to respond and to actually do it. So, so that's one thing I'd like to do. As far as financial aid for students, um, I do think that, that, that CMUS can provide some of the funding. It already does provide funding for some of the internships. I think we can expand on that. And as I, I mentioned earlier, through, uh, through working through and uh, working through existing organizations, getting some campaigns going, getting a sense of excitement about it because we can do a lot, we can do a lot. And, and if you think about the numbers of people that we've touched over the past 50 years, if each one of them would just give like $20, um, I think it's an important signal because it's not just the money that's important. It's a signal that it sends that our people are invested in our success and that they're willing to invest in the success of future generations of scholars. So I think that that's one thing that we can, we can do and we can offer it in terms of scholarships or we can offer it in terms of internships. Um, as far as the K through 12 curriculum, we have a wonderful department of curriculum and instruction at UT Austin, one of the best in the country. And we can look at either hiring some of those professors to help us put together some curricula, or some of the graduate students, let that, let that be something that they can do during the summer when, when graduate students are oftentimes stretched trying to find some, something to help them pay the rent. So I do think that we have that, um, that, um, that ability to, to, to tap into existing resources. We don't have to do the work ourselves. We have people who are experts. Let, let's them, let show them what we wanna do and then let them have at it and get to get a, a great graphic design person. I think we already have one on, on, on our staff um, and, uh, and let them put together something really beautiful and memorable and, and make sure that it's getting used in different places. And so lastly, why do I wanna be the CMOS director? Um, it's a good question. It's something that uh, I, I did not arrive at the decision to submit my application or my letter of intent. Um, lightly. It, it required a lot of soul searching for, for three reasons. I do think that I could be uh, an effective um, CMAS director. I bring not just the past 23 years of my experience on the UT campus, but I bring really 20 years as a journalist before that, and even before that as an undergraduate. There's lots of cumulative experience that I've, I've garnered over the years. And I think I bring, I bring a pretty good tool set to put CMOS on a different level. I think that I've been inside CMOS, but I've also been outside CMOS and it affords me, I think of a great perspective on what can be done and what is easy to do and can be accomplished quickly and then what's going to take a lot more effort and, and maybe we need to be working on that on the longer term. So I think it's good for, it would be good for CMOS. Um, I also think it would be good for VOSIS. Um, like I mentioned earlier, VOSIS has been my, my baby for, uh, for 22 years now. I've, I've raised it from, from nothing to where, what it is today. We have a, a wonderful staff. I have 11 people that, that work for VOSIS as full-time, part-time, occasional employees. They know what they're doing. They're, we have, we have a, a staff guide so they know how to do what they, if, if, they, if we hire new people. Uh, we have committed people who know who, who have that. And we have a network of people throughout the country that has really been pushing for, for voices and who is really committed to see us uh, get to that next level. I do think it's important for voices to have someone coming in from the outside to have it go to the next level. And that's why I do think that hiring somebody who's a highly skilled, someone who has strong skills in oral history and in public history, voices can really be bumped up. You know, I've, I've, I feel like I've done a pretty good job, but I think that somebody else can bring it to a new level and something that, that's even more special. And then finally, for me, you know, I have been, uh, and I'm not complaining about it, but I have given a lot of myself to, uh, to WOSIS over the years. Um, haven't, I can't think of a single, too many vacations that I've taken where I haven't had WOSIS related uh, meetings or something that I was gonna do at that destination. 
Um, I think everybody knows that I've served as the volunteer director for all this time, spent my summers, spent my everything. So I have been asked before to apply for different positions and I've always said no, because my plate was full. I wanted, I wanted to see voices succeed and I felt that I needed to be the, the person at the helm. Um, so this is a little bit selfish of me because one thing that I do love is I love programming and I see CMOS uh, provides me, would provide me an opportunity to, to develop myself. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not very young anymore, but I am still like a lot of us in, in, in academia, we are still eager to learn new things. We're still eager to develop our own skills. And I am one of those people I'm eager to learn uh, apply what I've already learned over all these many years and apply it to CMOS. I'm eager for a new challenge. Uh, CMOS has a, has a broader, a broader uh, mission than, than in some ways than Voices does. It has a slightly different, it's related, there's lots of linkages possible, but it, but it is a little bit different. And so I, I just for my own personal growth, just uh, I, I would love to do this. I would love to to, to see what I can do with, with CMOS and, and, and have a chance to work with closely with, uh, with really the, the amazing directors that we have now and the affiliates that we have now. Um, you know, CMOS has always been my kind of my home away from my journalism home and uh, to spend more time here with CMOS would really be a, a great blessing. I would really love to do that. So thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Um, and we've run a little bit over, but um, I did hit you with four or five questions <laughs> right at the end there. <laughs> so it's on me. Um, but uh, I am delighted to um, say we've, we've reached the end of this conversation, um, this delightful conversation with lots of good thoughts for the future of CMOS. I now want to expressly remind anyone that's come to this uh, talk, please give us your feedback. So you will be receiving that. It will also, we will also have it online available. We will have the recordings available as early as um, to today, perhaps. I, I believe actually um, they will be added to YouTube, but also onto our website where you will be able to access the feedback. Um, so please uh, take the time. We're very grateful for that. And um, otherwise, I'm going to say uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you. All.